Good morning. Thank you uh, for joining us uh, online for our study this morning. Uh, again, uh, if you haven't watched the introductory uh, video that I recorded earlier for you, uh, my name is Lee Hargett. I worship with the Gardendale uh, Church of Christ. And from time to time, I speak for other congregations uh, part-time. Um, I'm heavily in the work there at Gardendale and, and teaching classes, and uh, as long as with my wife, uh, Krista. Uh, and we're so delighted to be invited uh, to bring these lessons to you. Um, so if you're at home, I hope you have your Bible ready. Uh, if you've got your coffee, how you like it, you know, maybe let's set that aside and let's truly try to focus uh, on the Scriptures this morning. Uh, I know if you're at home, it can be kind of distracting, but let, let's truly focus our minds uh, this morning on what the Word of God uh, is listening for you. And I hope you have your Bible. Um, this uh, study in this first lesson, uh, I like to present it in a uh, Bible class type of arena, but uh, for this way, I hope maybe we can uh, learn some lessons about it because I'm going to do a teaching more so about the Bible, uh, nonetheless than from the Bible. But we will look at uh, several scriptures this morning uh, as we study God's Word. The Bible says in John chapter 20, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. The Apostle John is writing his biography about Jesus the Christ. And he is writing, so here in John chapter 20, saying all of these things that he has written down for us, that it's so that we may believe that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, and that we might believe in his name. You know, he wrote about his teachings, about, all, about his parables, about him coming to die for the sins of the world. And when I started to get into college, uh, having grown up in the, in the Church of Christ around uh, a lot of family members that were Christians, and pretty much everyone I knew that I grew up with were Christians or, in fact, believed in Jesus. But as soon as I got to college, I started getting exposed to people of different faiths, different religions, and I started having to ask myself some very difficult questions, such as, you know, can I be sure that the Bible is in fact true? That it actually came from God? And we're going to examine some things this morning about what does the Bible claim about itself? You know, here in this passage, it tells us that John is writing so that we may believe in Christ. Well, another question is, okay, do we have what was originally written down? You know, there are critics that will say we don't have what was originally written down. That just because you write something down and you put it in the ground and then, you know, a couple hundred years later you find it, does that really make sure that it's true? And so as we study this morning, I think it's going to be a lesson that's going to challenge our faith and help us understand, do we have God's Word? And is God's Word actually true? And I'm going to present some things, some lessons that I've learned uh, throughout my walk uh, with the Lord. The first question that, that we're going to discuss this morning is what does the Bible claim about itself? What does the Bible claim about itself? Uh, a very familiar passage, one that you are probably already thinking about. And that's 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16 through 7, 17. And the scripture says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, I was in having a conversation uh, with someone about the Bible, and uh, back in college, you know, I immediately thought about this verse. And they asked me, you know, how do you know the Bible's true? Well, I'm like, you know, the Bible says it's true. It says that Scripture is given by inspiration of God, that, that it's God-breathed, as the King James Version would say. But, you know, having a conversation with someone that may not necessarily believe in the Bible, they may not get the, the idea to prove the Bible can't prove itself. But you may have to look at other sources. And, and so we had a conversation, 
And some verses that came to mind were, okay, but what does the Bible claim about itself? Does it claim it, it comes from God? Uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, I believe that it is. That it is perfect for the reproof of man, that it makes us complete, and that for every good work, we can be complete in the Lord in our study. Notice uh, what Peter says. Uh, the Apostle Peter would say in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Uh, he says, you know, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter, you know, one of the closest apostles that, that Jesus had, he is saying, we actually saw these things happen. We were with him. You know, when the Pharisees, they come to him, you know, bring, trying to challenge his teaching. You know, we were there when they arrested him. You know, we, we actually, some of us, we kind of left him when he was up there on the cross. And we witnessed his resurrection. And so he's saying, we didn't just make up these stories. Because, you know, all of these stories going along, but for people that were there, if they were saying, you know, Jesus, he wasn't the real guy. You know, nobody was saying that. Because so many people witnessed him. So unlike some of the other religions where you only maybe have one guy's testimony uh, of something that may have happened, that they had a vision, but Peter is saying that they have many witnesses that actually saw Christ and his teaching. Uh, a familiar uh, verse that you may be aware of also is Luke. So you know, you, we've got four gospel accounts so basically, that's like four biographies uh, about Jesus. If you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. If you remember Luke, he was the, the author uh, of the Gospel of Luke, and as well as the Acts of the Apostles. And Luke is considered to be a historian. If you read his account, it is very historical. You know, he named certain people at certain times uh, of an era in the his, history, such as, you know, Tiberius Caesar in his 15th year reign, this such and such happened. But look how he addresses in Luke chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compare a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, but it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Luke is writing to uh, Theophilus, and it's said that he's probably some kind of official uh, there uh, in, in the Gentile nation there, and Luke is writing to him so that the things that he's been taught, that he can be sure about his faith, about maybe having faith in Jesus. That if you noticed, it said he they were eyewitnesses again about all these things. And that, that is a thing I'm going to stress in this lesson, that they were all eyewitnesses about the miracle, about the healing, about Christ being raised from the dead. And if you follow along in Acts chapter 1, uh, Luke, he would write a similar uh, greeting uh, to Theophilus there. Uh, and lastly, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, it tells us that God, who at various times and in various ways, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, but has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, that through him, whom also he made the world. The Hebrew writer opens up you know, his great book uh, telling us uh, as he's writing to Jewish Christians that you know, all those prophets that spoke in time past, you know, God spoke to them directly. But you know, in these last days, God has spoken to us through who? He's spoken to us through his son Jesus and that we are to listen to that teaching so that we can know how we can conduct our lives, how we can you know, be righteous uh, before the Lord God. And so the Hebrew writer is giving us the admonition that we look to Jesus for spiritual wisdom. 
And we look to him for the guidance. Because this says that he is the creator of the world. And so these are some things, some verses. Please, please take these notes down. Uh, I, I provide a lot of the scriptures on the PowerPoint. Uh, and I may go a little faster than for you to turn there. But please write these scriptures down uh, for your further study. And so I think we answered what the Bible tells about itself. A uh, number two a question that I had to ask myself throughout my study about the Bible in determining is it in fact from God is do we have what was originally written down? You know, you may have heard of the game uh, called Telephone. And what is what critics will say is, you know, the Bible is kind of like the game Telephone. You know, if I had a brother or sister over here in the audience and I told her, you are my absolute best friend. And the way the game of telephone works is this brother will tell it to somebody else, they'll tell it to somebody else, until he gets all the way to the other side of the room. And then I'm going to go down and ask that brother what they said. And the point of that game is that you're supposed to whisper it around. And then by the time it gets all the way back here, it's been totally changed. It's, it could say that you're nothing but a fool. Well, was that what originally happened? And people will say, you know, that's what happened with the Bible. That the Bible story, it's been changed over time, and we actually don't even have what the apostles really wrote down. And so I started looking, in, looking into that challenge. And do we have what was originally written down? Uh, this is going to be the part of the lesson. Uh, it's maybe more historical than actually looking at the scriptures. But, but please bear with me as these are some very critical points uh, for our study uh, about the Bible. Um, if you know Josh McDowell, he is a, a Bible researcher, and he's done a lot of evidence study for the text of the manuscripts of the Bible. And what he, he did in his study about the Scriptures is he came up with what's called the bibliographical test. Now, I know that word has like, probably the word Bible in it, but really what it means is what he writes in his book is that the bibliographical test is it compares the closeness of the Old and New Testament extant manuscript. And that word extant, it simply just means like known. Like we actually have these manuscripts here today. So it says it compares the Old and New Testament manuscripts to its original autograph. Now an autograph, it's not... He's not saying it's your John Hancock, but an autograph is the actual Luke writing the Gospel of Luke, him writing that. So it compares our oldest manuscript to the original autograph of the Apostle. And it takes the date of each book and it compares them to the nearest known extant manuscripts that we have. And so it's comparing the date to when it was originally written down and to the date of the actual manuscript that we have today. Uh, and I hope that was clear. Uh, secondly, uh, what this test does, that it compares the number of the biblical extant manuscripts with the other number and the earliness of extant manuscripts of other ancient documents. And, you know, you're probably familiar with Homer or Aristotle, uh, Herodias. Uh, if you ever took a uh, high school English class, you probably had to read some of their you know, Greek literature, uh, some of those big stories that we had to read in high school. Well, some of you probably may have read. If you're like me, I had to try to get the, the cliff notes and just try to get you know, just the basics about what was going on. And so, but here I have what could be called a bibliographical test. Well, I would, if you're in the audience, I would be showing you with a laser pointer online, but you've probably got the electronic copy. So I'll do my best to navigate with you here. But in this very first column, the one on the far left, this gives us the gospel account. You know, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, then you have uh, the Apostle Paul and his letters. And then below that, you have some other documents from other historians, uh, such as uh, Josephus. Uh, and then you also have Tacitus. And in the second column, you have what's called the date of events. So this is the date of events in which their writings actually happened. So we know that Jesus lived from about 4 B.C. Uh, to 30 A.D. 
33 AD, uh, if you will. And so we know that he lived during those times. Well, Josephus, uh, he would write about from about 200 BC to AD 70. And what Josephus primarily wrote about was the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's said that he's a very reliable source about the destruction of Jerusalem and its description. And then if you're familiar with Tacitus, he's a, a Roman historian, and he writes about events around the time of Christ, which is about A.D. 14 uh, to A.D. 68. The next two columns is you have the date of writing and the earliest text. Well, we know that the Gospel accounts, uh, they were actually written down anywhere from 50 to 70 A.D. Uh, if you remember Paul, he's on his missionary journey, and he, he, he's shipwrecked. He's stuck on certain islands. He's on house arrest. Well, these are the times where he's actually writing his letter to 1 Timothy, uh, to 2 Timothy, uh, to Philemon. You know, all these New Testament books. That's the time of, of writing when those things occurred. And then in the column right next to it, you have uh, what's the earliest text. So that is the manuscript that we actually have today. And if you would, uh, if you look at John's Gospel, uh, in, in the John Gospel line item, it says a canticle for 130. And so that's around the time of 130 AD, of the earliest manuscript we have. And you compare that to Josephus, you compare that to Tacitus, you know, John's is within about 80 years from the event to the writing. You, get, you compare that to Josephus, which is around 10 to 300 years, that, that is very astounding uh, of a statistic to know in the closeness of how accurate the Bible is compared to other uh, manuscripts. And what's really interesting to know is this last column. This last column tells us from the event to the actual text. So you have the event of Jesus dying on the cross, and then you have the text that we have today. Well, that text for, that we have about Christ in, in the Gospels you know, it's usually less than 200 years, less than 100 years for the Gospel of John, of the earliest manuscript that we have known today. And if you're looking there at Josephus, you know, that is about 1,000 to 1,300 years from the events taking place to the actual text we have. Now, and this is what is called the bibliographical test. It's simply comparing the closeness of the New Testament to other documents. Because, you know, if you throw out the Bible and say it is inaccurate in its closeness to writing those events, then you have to throw out any other ancient document in its closeness because there is no comparison. And this lesson this morning, it is just, you know, a drop in the bucket about the volumes and volumes written about the Scriptures and its closeness. And I, so, and I hope that it just whets your appetite for this discussion, as I believe it is very important to our faith in knowing, do I have what was originally written down? You know, it's said about the manuscript evidence. Uh, Rob Van De Way, uh, he wrote a book that, that I highly recommend, a book full of evidences that, that teach you about ancient Jerusalem, about the time and place, and how people got their New Testament scriptures. He writes in his book, you know, the New Testament is by far the most reliable ancient writing known today. You know, there are exist as many as an astounding 25,000 manuscripts that contain all or portions of the New Testament. And so you've got about 25,000 portions of the New Testament, uh, some whole and, and some not. And what's so important for the compilation of the New Testament is you take this manuscript, found this area, you take this other one, and you lay them on top of each other. And you see, okay, does this match? And you know, the more and more documents you have, the better of an accuracy you can get. You know, in comparison about these manuscripts, you know, you compare that to any other writings. Uh, if you've read Homer's Iliad, uh, it's said that it's in second place, and there are around 600 to about 1,800 uh, copies of Homer's Iliad. Now, you compare that to the 25,000 of the Bible, uh, there is just no comparison. 
Secondly, you know, by contrast, the manuscripts with most other ancient books, these date from about 1,000 years after the original composition. And, and we saw that on the previous slide in the bibliographic set. And, and thirdly, the oldest copy of the Iliad, uh, it dates about 500 years after it was originally written down. And this is a dramatic contrast to the oldest papyri text of the New Testament, you know, which is a part of chapter 18 of the Gospel of John. And that's dated at around 125 AD. And if you're familiar with that, it's called the Rylance Fragment. You know, just a, it looks like a little index card. You, you can Google that uh, if you're at home uh, after the lesson. Uh, this is very, very important things we're talking about this morning. Uh, because as we look at how God has preserved his word for us, it is so amazing. Uh, here's a couple examples of these manuscripts I've been talking about. And there are no other important manuscripts than I believe in these three right here. Uh, that's Codex Vaticanus, uh, Codex Sinaiticus, and Codex Alexandrian. Now, I've said it before, there are volumes written about these, about these three manuscripts. And I'm just trying to whet your appetite. Because this could be a whole gospel meeting of lessons of the history about these manuscripts. And people have written many books about it. And I encourage you to seek it out because it is amazing what we can find, what God has done to preserve His Holy Word for us. And a difficult question uh, throughout my study uh, in these manuscripts, uh, I remember I was studying uh, with one of my friends and he had a different version of the Bible that I was studying with. And we came up to a, a big crossroad. And one of the questions was, you know, why do some verses only appear in a few versions of the Bible? Uh, if you would, turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. If you're familiar with this chapter, you know, it's telling us about the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, Philip, he comes to him and he asks him, you know, do you understand what you're reading? And it said that he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. He's reading uh, Isaiah chapter 53, and that's where he tells them uh, about the gospel of Jesus, that, you know, Isaiah is talking about the Messiah. He's talking about the Christ. And if you're reading uh, from the New King James Version uh, or the American Standard Version, uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, uh, I, I've on the screen uh, my New King James Version, and it says... Uh, after he's been taught the gospel, uh, verse 37, it says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And throughout my study uh, with my friend, he looked at me and he said, Lee, verse 37 is not in my Bible. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It, it's right there. It's right after verse 36. And well, he showed it to me. And you know what? That verse was not there. And as I looked, started studying my own Bible, in the margin, I had a footnote. And in the, on the screen, you can see that writing underneath. And what that writing says is that the NU text and M text omit this verse. It is found in Western texts, including the Latin tradition. And I, and I read that to my friend, and we both looked at each other, and we're like, what does that mean? You know, what do these NU texts and M texts mean? Well, after going to see you know, our local preacher at our church and trying to get some more information about how come the Bible has some verses and, and some versions are different than others. And it all has to go back to these manuscripts. Now, don't sometimes our, our minds will try to think of, okay, they found this uh, manuscript in Jerusalem. So it must say the exact same thing over here. But we're, we're going to see here about these known errors that people say there are. But what the NU text, that, that's simply a group of manuscripts they look at to translate from the Greek to the English. And the M text, I believe that's known as the Masoretic text or Masoretic text. These were uh, those Jewish uh, historians that would actually take the Bible and they would copy all these manuscripts all together. 
And so these are just different types of manuscript groups that they use to translate some of these uh, Greek manuscripts into English. And I, I will say that there are some uh, manuscripts and versions that don't include Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And there are other passages that the, the New Testament, of if you're reading in the English Standard Version, uh, the New American Standard Version, uh, it's going to have a footnote and say that these aren't in the earliest uh, known text. And, and I just want to bring this to your attention. Uh, any good Bible will have a preface. And in the preface, it'll tell you what sources that it used. And I usually encourage people to get a, a version of the Bible that is a literal uh, word for word. And that has good footnotes. And that it, it's a good Bible help for your discussion. And throughout my study, you know, that really started challenging my faith. You know, are some of these verses, is it okay that it's not in there? Does it change what is actually being said? Well, it's been said that if you take all the verses that are up for question, should they be in there, should they not be in there, that you could fit all of those on a standard 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper. And if you, um, in, in regards to these errors, some of the estimated for as many as 200,000 of variant readings. And what these variant readings are, it's something that are strictly grammatical. If we understand languages, we know certain words change. Words are added uh, to, excuse me, to the dictionary, such as you know airplane. You know airplane wasn't around during Jesus' time. The word Google was not around. You know Google has become a verb when you Google something. And as we look at the way words were changed in their spelling, you know if there if the word judgment. Now, I believe judgment used to have an E in there. Well, now it does, now it doesn't. Well, if that word was in the Bible 200,000 times and it's changed once or twice, you know, is that 200,000 errors? And I guess. But does that actually change the meaning of the word? I don't, I don't think so. And secondly, uh, in these errors, you know, these readings are spread out over 5,300 manuscripts. So that a variant spelling of one letter and one word and one verse, well, I guess that's 2,000 manuscripts is counted as 2,000 errors. And I think if we look at the significance of that, is that really significant? That a single word may have an E left off. Um, and so those are something to note in regards to the critics calling errors in the scriptures. Uh, and finally, the conclusion. Uh, by the renowned uh, Bible scholar F.F. F. Bruce. He writes, you know, these variant readings about which any doubt remains among textual critics of the New Testament, that they affect no material question of historic fact of Christian faith or practice. You know, if you scan the New Testament documents, you know, none of these supposedly verses that should be in the Bible or they shouldn't be, none of these affect any church doctrine. Or our faith. <clears throat> and you may ask me, I may tell somebody, you know, you throw out all of these manuscripts, you, you burn them all, you know, all the 25,000. You know, we can still compile the New Testament, and that's through the letters by early Christians. Uh, the uh, Bruce Metzger writes, you know, so extensive are the citations that if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they, that is the citations of the early Christian writers, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. So that's if, you know, I'm an early Christian. I'm writing to my brother, you know, listen, remember what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15? He says, you study. Show thyself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. And, and, and sometimes these uh, Christians, they would write whole chapters worth of New Testament scripture. And so you compile all of those uh, letters that they wrote, 
you can virtually create the entire New Testament. Now that is something that cannot be said for any other religious document in the world. And now we got to consider, you know, some of the non-Christian uh, testimony. Uh, you've probably heard of some of these men, uh, Flavius uh, Josephus. Uh, he writes a little bit about Christ. Uh, Cornelius Tacitus. Uh, and thirdly, you have what's called the Jewish Talmud. And that's really more so a commentary about Jewish law. But it was there uh, that kind of gives some insight to Christ. Uh, it gives some insight to the Christian movement. And I've provided uh, one quotation from Josephus. He writes in his Antiquities, uh, chapter 18, verse 63. Uh, this could, could be considered one of the most notable references to Christ. But it also uh, maybe has some challenges on was this uh, scripture tampered with to make Jesus look more than what he was. And, and I, I just bring that up because some people will actually challenge this verse. Uh, but at the beginning it says, you know, about this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was the achiever of extraordinary deeds and was a teacher of those who accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. He was indicted by the principal men among us, and Pilate condemned him to be crucified. Uh, then he goes on uh, telling some other uh, things real quickly about him. But I think what's important is that it gives credit to who Jesus was, that it says some think he was the Messiah. And I don't think, if you ask anybody, did Jesus actually live? And you look at these non-Testament sources, I think there's good evidence that he actually did. That it is just ludicrous to think that Jesus never actually walked on this earth. And so I think, I think I've presented to you, like, do we have what was originally written down? And I tell you, there is so much written about that that I hope I can encourage you to seek that out. But the last question I ask myself, do we have, you know, is what was written down true? You know, just because you say, Lee, okay, you've made a good case that we had what they wrote down. But does what they wrote down, does that mean it's true? You know, does that actually mean that Jesus rose from the dead? Does that actually mean that he healed Lazarus? I mean, come on. How do we know that those things are actually true? And the best case that I've looked at trying to present, do we have what was written down? It goes back to that eyewitness testimony. And the best case is the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. You know, there is no more far evidence that outweighs the eyewitness testimony about Jesus being resurrected from the grave. Because if we can't understand and believe that he rose from the grave, then all these other Bible stories they don't make sense. You know, if we can't believe that actually God himself raised up his son Jesus from the grave. And the greatest support I have for this, uh, you remember what I said in Matthew chapter 28? Matthew chapter 28. Uh, real quickly in the lesson will be yours. I have a couple, few moment, moments with, you, with the time that I have. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 11, you remember what the guards said when they came to the tomb? It says, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell the people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. They made it up. They say, no, you tell his disciples that his disciples came and stole the body. Don't tell them that the tomb's empty. And, and what we see here is that if they had the body, they would not have said that at all. They would have said, you're crazy. Look, the body is right here. But notice, that's not what they said. They actually had to come up with something else. And secondly, as we mentioned before, the eyewitness testimony. Uh, we won't turn there, but please write this scripture down. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is telling, making the case about how Jesus died, he rose, 
and he was resurrected for our benefit. And he goes on to tell that over 500 people witnessed the resurrected Christ. That he was shown to Peter, he was shown to the women, but of last of all, he was shown to me, Paul. And, and that's what Paul writes. Now you compare that to uh, the Islam, you compare that to Joseph Smith and, and Mormonism and all these other you know, religions. I don't think you can come up with that many witnesses to show that their visions that they've had actually are from God. But you compare these four biographies about Christ and about all these other men and women that actually witnessed him, I believe that makes a great case for Jesus. And I believe that makes a great case for us to believe that these things written down are actually true. And lastly, and very importantly, is that the disciples were willing to die. You know, a lot of people in history, they've died for a lot. But, you know, what is important to know about the apostles, uh, in Acts 4 it says, you know, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. But for us, you know, who would say, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And I think that's exactly what the apostles did. You know, they were willing to die for what they believed in. If they, what they believed in was true. And somebody may say, well, Lee, plenty of people have died for a lie. But what's important about the apostles is that if Jesus did not, wasn't resurrected, they would have had to have known about it. And if they knew about it, why were they willing to die for it? And the most, one of the most important apostles, I think, was the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Here you have a man who is holding the clothes of Stephen, who is getting killed. He's dragging people all the way back to Jerusalem to have them thrown into prison. And how he is converted to, for the faith and you know, willing to go to Rome to preach before you know, the, the official there, you know, that does not make sense if Jesus was never resurrected. And we see that all the apostles, most of them were martyred uh, for Jesus' sake. And I believe that is a very important testimony the resurrection of Christ. We've discussed a lot of things uh, this morning. Uh, you know, all of these things I've presented, uh, if I were to present this to my great-grandmother, who, who was a, a patriarch of the faith in my family, if I was to present all of this to her, she may say, Lee, you know, that, that's really good and all. But you know, doesn't Jesus want us to be people of faith? Uh, one last scripture, and the lesson will be yours. In John chapter 20. John chapter 20, if you remember, uh, the apostle Thomas, he comes up to him and to the other apostles and says, you know, unless I put my hands in his hands and, and I touch him, I will not believe that Christ rose from the dead. You know, I'm not going to believe it unless I see him and I'm there. But listen to what he says in John 20. Jesus shows up. Uh, I'm looking at John 20, uh, verse 26. Uh, it says, Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it into my side. Do not be disbelieved, but believe me. Thomas answered him, he said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The Hebrew writer, he encourages us to have faith. That faith is having not seen it before, but moving in obedience to Christ Jesus. And Jesus is telling us, you know, blessed are those who have not seen it yet, but are seeing it through faith. And I believe a person can be justified in Jesus Christ if they don't know about all these historians, about all the manuscripts. But as I said, my great-grandmother, she had faith in Jesus because she trusts in the Lord. And I think we can do that too. And if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, we obey Him, 
and we trust in him, that he can be the Lord of our life. But, you know, for people like me, that I can sometimes have a skeptical mind, just like Thomas. But isn't it amazing that God has accurately preserved his word for us? You know, I truly believe we have what was originally written down. And I truly believe that what was written down is actually true. Thank you so much for paying attention to, to this lesson. Uh, I hope to talk to you more about it. You can find me on Facebook, uh, Lee Hargett. I love to discuss this further with you. But uh, till till next time, till our next lesson, thank you so much uh, for listening.